Beaches are found in coastal areas all over the world. But the sediment that those beaches consist of can vary a lot between different geographic locations. For example, take a look at these coarse grained shingle beaches in Ireland and in France. Or at these beaches in Australia and at Zanzibar, which are made up of much finer sandy material. And not only the grain size, also the origin of the beach material can be very different. Depending on the location, the beach material may originate from granite, the main continental rock, from volcanic rock or from seashells or coral. Actually, beaches are made of whatever loose material is available. If you ask a visitor what a Dutch beach is made of, they will probably say light colored sand. But what does this sand consist of? It's actually tiny grains of quartz and feldspar, the two most common minerals found in solid rock. But how did all these grains end up here at the beach and where did they come from? The answer to these questions takes us all the way up along a river into the mountains. Here in the Alps, where the water has only traveled a few kilometers, the river is still very steep, has a narrow channel and a limited water discharge. This discharge varies heavily throughout the year. During larger flow rates, the river transports larger particles, which will be abraded further downstream. During this ride, the debris is broken down even further by rolling over the bed and colliding with other grains. Here in the lower course of the Rhine, we find sediment that is already much more like the sand we find at the beach. What is left are grains of quartz and feldspar, the minerals that also make up solid mountain rock. Now let's find out how a sandy beach evolves under the influence of wave action. If you have ever built a sand castle on a beach, you must have experienced the capacity of waves and currents to transport sand. Even though these waves are relatively small, they manage to wipe out every sign of the sand castle within 30 minutes. Beaches generally respond to the seasons. Let us look at the profile of a beach, perpendicular to the shoreline. In summer, most of the sand is found higher up the profile, where it might form a so-called summer burn, around the waterline. The higher, more energetic waves in winter move sand down the profile, such that a pronounced sandbar is formed further offshore. When the smaller summer waves set in again, the bar is gradually lowered and the berm is restored. If sand only moves on and offshore with the seasons, why does it not pile up at the mouth of the rivers that deliver it? Why does it form into beaches that stretch for hundreds of kilometers down the coast? You may have noticed that waves usually approach the coast at an angle, not straight on. This is because wave directions are determined by the winds that created the waves. When waves from a certain direction approach the coast, their crests tend to become more and more parallel to the coastline, but a small angle remains. Let us observe Max at the beach with oblique waves, throwing some markers into the surf zone. How do the breaking waves influence the movement of these markers? With every breaking wave, the markers move towards the beach, but they are transported along the coast as well. The water movement inside and outside the surf zone can also be made visible using dye injections. 
the dye shows that the water outside the surf zone hardly moves at all. In the surf zone, however, water clearly moves down the coast. This flow of water is called the alongshore current. It is driven by the process of wave breaking. So apparently these oblique waves are driving an alongshore current. As sediment grains are transported by currents, these waves must also be driving an alongshore sediment transport. The sediment is stirred up by the breaking waves and is then transported down the coast with the alongshore current. So we can think of the beach as a river of sand.